Hi everyone, welcome back. This is Clemence with the Gourmandie School here for day six of bread camp, ready to talk to you about sourdough bread. So we have graduated from making breads with store-bought yeast in like three to four hours time because store-bought yeast is very, very efficient. It's grown in the lab. It's got its food surrounding it already. So as soon as you give it some water and some oxygen, it begins to wake up. But we've also been growing sourdough cultures in our kitchens all week. And so today's class is about learning how to use that wild yeast to make your breads grow. And the main difference between using store-bought yeast and using wild yeast is time. Um, so instead of waiting an hour between each step, we were going to be using like six to 12 hour windows between each step. Let's first talk about what sourdough is and isn't. Sourdough bread isn't just this super soury vinegary bread that you get uh, made with white flour in San Francisco. And it's not just like a big crusty loaf. Sourdough is a way of leavening or making bread rise with natural or wild yeast. Yeast that's not grown in the lab, but that's cultivated from whatever exists in your kitchen. So you can make a brioche with sourdough starter. You can make a baguette with sourdough starter. You can make a various uh, number of breads with it and that's how all bread was made in the world before the late 1800s when um, cultivated yeast was developed that grows in a lab. So it's not like some new hipster movement. Sourdough bread is the way bread was made for a millennia before we began cultivating yeast in a lab. So let's first talk about how to tell if your sourdough starter is ready to use and strong enough and like the perfect timing in order to power the growth of your bread so there's two things that i look for when i'm looking at my sourdough starter for starters this is my culture um this is like my fourth take so um it's been a couple hours and it's kind of warm in my kitchen so i'm kind of at the tail end of this sourdough starters um lifespan you could say so if it was another hour i would smell it and it would smell very vinegary that's a telltale sign that your starter is really hungry um and in which case i would feed it so i would take most of it away and give it equal parts water and flour um, and then let it sit for about six to eight hours and then at that peak time i'll be able to use it to power the bread so Here's another way that you can tell. So the first step was to smell it. If it smells sweet and tangy, it is ready to go. If your sourdough starter smells very vinegary, that means it's hungry. So I'm gonna take a little wet hand here and give it the float test. And the float test will determine how ready my starter is. What I want is to see it float. There we go. See how the starter is floating in the water there? That means that there's a lot of gas in there it's got a lot of buoyancy and that means that it is ready to use to power my bread. So you'll do that test with your starter at home. Wait for it to smell sweet and tangy and wait for it to float when you put it in a cup of water. All right, I'm going to wash my hands really fast. Okay, you ready to go? Let's talk about all the different steps there is to making sourdough bread now that we know that our starter is active and ready to go. So, made you a little chart here. This is no different than all the steps that we talked about in the last five days for making bread. Step one is always activate the yeast. That means feed it with some oxygen, sugar, and water um, to wake it up. And in the like realm of sourdough bread baking, that first step is called the levain. So to make your levain, which is the mixture that's going to power the growth of your bread throughout the rising process and then later when you're baking it, you need to take active sourdough starter. So sourdough starter that floats and smells like sweet and tangy, and you're gonna mix it with a very specific ratio of water and flour. So for the recipe that we're using, we're using about 30 grams of sourdough starter, active sourdough starter, um, about 65 grams of water and 65 grams of flour. When I'm baking bread in the winter time and I wanna follow the same timeline, I will add a little bit more starter because it's gonna grow really slowly because it's cold out. And in the summertime, I cut back on it a little bit. So for the purposes of this recipe, it's about 30 grams of sourdough starter, 65 grams of water, and 65 grams of bread flour. We're gonna mix those together and wait six to eight hours. If you have six hours, great. If you're like, oh, I really wanna get it done in five, add a pinch of rye flour to it. Rye right here. Um, it's very exciting for yeast and it makes it wake up super quickly. Uh, all right, then 
the second step, sort of almost when you're done waiting for this to be done, so like around the six hour mark, you're going to take the bulk of the water and flour that make up your bread dough. You're gonna mix them together and wait 30 minutes to an hour. This process called autolyse gives the flour time to be hydrated by the water um, and it makes it easier than to incorporate the levain and the salt. So step one is to kickstart the growth of your yeast with some flour and water, that's the levain. Step two is autolyse. It means taking the bulk of the water and the flour that make up your bread dough, mixing them together and letting them hang out for a little bit. Step three is to mix your dough. So you're going to take the levain and the autolyse and your salt, and you're going to mix them together until they look really even. And the fourth step is to knead your bread. If some of you were able to take the focaccia lesson, which is still up by the way, we practiced a method of folding called, a method of kneading called stretching and folding, where we took our dough and we stretched it and folded it onto itself. That's fun. Um, so that method of stretching and folding in order to knead the dough is a way to knead the dough that's really wet so that all those gluten proteins get um, organized into a strong webbing to be able to expand and capture the gas that the yeast is going to give off when it's um, releasing carbon dioxide. So what we want to do is to knead this dough really gently. We're going to do it um, stretching and folding and stretching and folding until it resists and then let it rest for 20 minutes. And those gluten proteins will stay organized but will unkink and relax a little bit so that we can go back and stretch and fold them again in that organized web. So that is the method of kneading this. It is the only time in this recipe where you're kind of just married to the timing. So you want to do this every 20 minutes to half hour over a couple of um, hours. And then you're going to let it bulk rise. And this is where you can choose your own adventure. You can let it rise at room temperature, temperature for about three hours, or you can put it in the fridge for up to 12 hours. So that's bulk rise, it happens in a blob. Number six is to shape your dough. You're gonna take that dough, split it in half because the recipe I'm giving you makes two loaves of bread, and you're going to um, shape it and put it into either a loaf pan or a banneton, which is a bread proofing basket. We'll talk about all the alternatives that you could use. Um, and then you're going to let it proof. You can let it proof or do its final rise at room temperature for about three hours or in the fridge for eight to 12 hours. That's where you get to choose your own adventure again. And once it's sufficiently proofed, you're going to slash your bread and bake it. And I'll show you how we bake our bread for that nice crusty textured loaf. I bake it in a Dutch oven, um, but when I put it in a loaf pan, which I'll also show you, I just proof it and bake it in the same pan. You guys ready? Okay, let's do this. All right. So step one is to make your levain. It's very difficult. You ready? You're gonna do something you've been doing all week, which is just to combine some sourdough starter with water and flour. And this ratio is very specific to grow in these time frames. are two loaves of bread. So first things first, you wanna grab a container that's you know at least like four to six inches tall. I'm gonna give you the volume measurements too. Don't freak out if you don't have a scale. But if those of you who have a scale, I'm just gonna tell you right now, it's about 65 grams of water. A little too much. It's all good. Okay, and now I'm going to add 30 grams of sourdough starter. So I'm going to press zero here. I'm going to grab my starter, drop it in. It's floating. There we go. Beautiful. And I'm gonna stir it up, you can use a spoon, you can use your fingers, you can use an offset spatula or a butter knife, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna mix this up so that the starter is sort of evenly incorporated into the water, dissolves a little bit. And now I'm going to add 30 grams of bread flour. If all you have is whole wheat flour, just cut back on the flour a little bit. And I'll show you the texture that you're looking for in your dough. I'm gonna need bread flour over here. And if you have all-purpose flour, use all-purpose flour. All-purpose flour isn't going to yield you as tall a loaf of bread, but you'll still have great bread. In which case, I usually bake this in a loaf pan because it has more support to allow your bread to rise when it's baking. But I'm gonna show you both ways of shaping those breads. Okay, here we go. Awesome. Take off a little bit here. Okay, I'm just gonna mix this up. 
it should look just like a thick batter. And once this is all mixed up really well, you're just going to leave it covered anywhere in your kitchen for about six to eight hours. Six hours if it's really warm in your kitchen, eight hours if it's really cold. And you want your water to be at room temperature. Okay, I'm gonna put a lid on this and I'm going to wait, um, how long did I say? Six to eight hours, give me one second. Close your eyes, pretend like six to eight hours went by. This is where the magic of television comes in. Oh my word, look how much it's risen in the last eight hours. That's incredible, it's almost doubled in size. Can you believe it? All right, so six to eight hours later, you're going, later, you're going to have your Levin. Not a huge difference between a starter and a Levin. I don't wanna confuse you, but they're about the same thing. It's just that the Levin is very specific in its amounts so that it can power your two loaves of bread. So when you're using water, be sure that you're using either spring water or filtered water in order to feed your Levin, use in your bread making, because wild yeast is a little bit more delicate and precious than your store-bought yeast, and it's going to want to be in some place that's not chlorinated. So here in Santa Monica, we're really lucky. There's no chlorine in our tap water. Um, what you can do is pour out your water the night before, the chlorine will evaporate, or you can filter the water, or you can buy spring water. Any questions about that, email us at hotmail at thegourmandyschool.com. So this is my Levin. We've completed step one. Those miraculous six hours went by so quickly. And now let's talk about step two, auto lease. So you'll find this in a lot of bread baking books and I don't want you to freak out and wonder like, oh my God, what is this crazy word? All it means is you're taking the water and the flour that make up most of your dough and you're going to combine them together and let them hang out for like 30 minutes. It's gonna help to get everything hydrated. It'll make it easier to incorporate your levain and your salt later. Um, so I'm gonna go get us some bowls and um, in the scale and some water and flour. Ready? Okay. Over here, I've got a bowl. And you may have heard, if you're on Instagram and you like to follow some like cool bakers about hydration, which is how much water you can get into your bread dough. And I'm here to tell you that it doesn't really mean anything because if I'm starting with like six cups of water um, and I have, let me restart that. If I'm starting with like 800 cups of 800 grams of water and I'm gonna use 700 grams of flour, it's going to be completely different if my flour is a white flour or a whole wheat flour. And that's because whole wheat flour still has bran in it and bran is really thirsty. So it matters less like how much water you put in and more about the ratio of water to the kind of flour that you have working with. Um, so I just want you to like not worry so much about things like hydration and all of that and worry more about like the texture of your dough and the viscosity of your dough um, because a really wet dough is more challenging to shape for beginners um, and a really dry dough isn't maybe going to produce the big holes that you want on the inside. We'll cover some more of that in a little bit. The first thing I'm going to have you do is to weigh out 700 grams of water. Same thing, room temperature water, don't overthink it. I'm gonna pour some in here. We're all gonna start with the same amount of water, 700 grams. Oops, I need a little bit more water. Hang on a moment. And I need more. got 700 grams of water and I want to make a loaf that has a lot of flavor so I definitely want some whole wheat flour in there because white flour has no flavor um, but I also want some bigger holes not huge because I don't want my Nutella or avocado to fall through but um, but I don't want too much of a closed crumb structure so I want a dough that's going to feel like uh, putty like a wet putty um, so what I'm gonna do uh, I know that I need 800 grams of flour is I'm going to do 200 grams of bread flour and again you can do whatever it is that you like and I'm going to talk to you later about what kind of bread you can expect from using different flours but I'm going to use 200 grams of bread flour 
bread flour comes from hard wet bread wheat but if it's white it has all the bran removed so it's just starch so it's just gonna power your bread up okay but it doesn't have any flavor so I'm gonna do just 200 grams out of the 800 of bread flour that's not efficient there we go and when you're buying white flour like bread flour or all-purpose flour make sure that it's unbleached that's really important Okay, I've got 200 grams of bread flour here, um, but I want all the flavor of whole wheat flour. So I'm gonna use a whole wheat flour called um, hard white. So when you're buying whole wheat flour at the store or bread flour, both of those are made from a variety of wheat called hard red wheat. Let me see if I've got it right here. Hold on a second. This is a hard red wheat. It's milled from this sweet berry right here. See how dark it is? It's got really strong gluten proteins that create a very good, strong webbing to capture yeast and steam, so it gives you a nice tall loaf. That's why if you make bread with einkorn or pastry flour or cake flour, you end up with like a very flat bread because those gluten proteins are not strong enough to expand as the yeast is trying to escape. So bread flour and whole wheat flour at the store typically come from this and they look different because whole wheat flour still has the bran on it, for, whereas um, bread flour has the bran sifted out. It's an oversimplification of what happens, but it helps to understand that. And then we have, this is a hard white, still as strong, but much lighter in color and much lighter in flavor. It's much milder. So I'm gonna get a nice tall loaf of bread that has some flavor, but it's a little bit sweeter and nuttier than if I was to use like a hard red wheat. So you can look for like white whole wheat at the store. We'll give you that. And as often as possible, try to get your whole wheat flours from local mills because they're usually working with farmers that are growing wheat less for high yield that they can just sell on the commodities exchange or, um, but more that they're growing wheat because they're delicious. They have really great strong properties for bread making or for pastries. So we work with Grist and Toll, it's a mill here in Pasadena um, and with a couple of local farmers that sell to our local farmers markets. This is a hard white wheat. Um, if you're looking to get a nice tall loaf of bread that has a lot of good whole wheat flavor, that intense whole wheat flavor, start with half bread flour, so 400 grams of bread flour, 400 grams. Um, the other half is your typical whole wheat flour from the grocery store that's made from hard red wheat. All right, I'm almost at 800 grams here. So total, I want 800 grams of flour, but because... Most of my flour here is a whole wheat, almost there. I might need something extra. Any guess what that is? The ingredient I might need more of is water. And I will know how much water I need after I sweep this a little bit. I don't want you to do this with your hands. I want you to hold your hand like a flat open paddle and just take your dough and begin to sweep. When we teach this class at the school, I let every student decide what kind of flour they want. And some students who use more whole wheat flour than white flour will need more water. And some students who use all white flour or a whole wheat flour like spelt or sonora that are very soft and not as thirsty really don't need to add any extra water. And when we add extra water, we add it right now. See how shaggy my dough is? If I get this in a nice tight ball of dough and then add water, it's going to be really difficult to incorporate it. Right now I see a lot of really dry shaggy bits and this is the perfect time to add a little bit more water so that I can get my dough to feel like wet putty. I'm gonna show you what that looks like in a moment. I'm still not squeezing my dough. My hand is just this flat open paddle, almost like a large open spatula the rubber spatula you use when making cakes and things. All right, here we go. Take a look at this dough here. Um, this is a really great hydration percentage. Like this dough is really great for beginner shapers. I can pick it up, it's not too wet. Those of you who want to experiment with making breads that have bigger holes in them, more hydration, you can add a little bit more water, but you gotta add it at this point. All right, here we go. So this is that process called arolis. It's just mixing the water and flour that make up the bulk of your bread dough and letting them hang out for about 
30 minutes. You can do an hour if you'd like to. Some recipes tell you to auto lease for three hours. They're all different. They're not wrong. Um, they're all different, but they all follow the same seven steps. Every single bread recipe that calls for leavening with a sourdough starter follows these same steps. So I'm gonna wash my hands really fast. The reason I wanted to highlight that, that they all look pretty much the same, is because some books go on for 30 pages about how to go through this process. And after you do step one, you're supposed to go for a walk and like write a poem about the leaves changing. And some of them are, uh, some of them are very like quick and simple and, um, and get right to the point. So all of them though follow the same basic principles, which is to wake up the sourdough starter with like the right amount of water and flour and really power it up. The second step is an auto lease, which is we, what we just did, mixing the water and flour together and letting it rest for a little bit. And this third step is mixing the dough. So for the dough, we're going to need our levain, which is our active starter water and flour, and we're going to need our auto lease, and we're going to need 16 grams of salt. So I've got my little salt cellar here. Try to avoid using salts that have anti-caking agents. So I like to use a flaked sea salt or kosher salt. There we go. And then we'll combine these two. Let's just pretend that uh, 30 minutes went by and now we're going to take our levain and our salt and add them to the auto lease to make up our dough. I like to wet my hand at this point because it helps my dough from feeling really sticky. So here we go. I'm gonna pour this over here. Hey Zavi, can you shut the front door for me please? Yeah. Thanks. I need water though. Okay, sorry, you're gonna have to wait. No, I need water. All right, so I'm gonna take this right now, my open hand here, and I put your dough out, I put your water out on the table earlier. Do you not see it? Well, go look in the bathroom then. Helper. Here. All right, so you're going to go get water. Oh, I need it. Hold on. There you go. All right, and my battery remaining just went off. Hold on, guys. We're super low tech today. Okay, so now to take the levain and add it to the, um, the dough with the salt, I'm using a method that I learned in Ken Forkish's book, which is called Flour, Water, Salt, and Yeast. It's a really great bread making book. Don't be intimidated by the charts and the way that it's written. It's written by somebody who clearly does this for a living, um, but his recipes are really fantastic. Um, so we're gonna do this method here. We're sort of cutting through everything and making sure that everything's really evenly incorporated. Shut the door and put that down. Thank you so much. Nope. Thank you. All right, so we're doing this to get everything well incorporated. There we go. And once this looks nice and even, we can start to do that stretch and folding technique the way that we need this dough. Okay. All right, so my dough is really wet and it would be very challenging to knead this like you traditionally do on a surface. So this is where that stretching and folding technique comes into play. I want you to pretend that your bowl is a square and that you're stretching and folding in each quadrant. So I'm gonna stretch and fold and give this a quarter turn and just keep doing that until the dough resists me. If I'm using flowers like spelt or rye, it's gonna take a lot more of those stretch and folds in order for the dough to come together and start to get taut and organized and start to resist you. But if you're using hard red wheats or hard white, like these really strong flowers, it's gonna happen very quickly. So there is no magic bullet that's gonna tell you or a recipe that's gonna tell you exactly how many stretch and folds you need every time you do a set of stretch and folds. You just need to listen to your dough. So my flat open hand is gonna reach under it's not squeezing and it's gonna stretch the dough out and flop it over and I'm gonna give it a quarter turn. What this is doing is telling those gluten proteins that are starting to bind together because the water is creating this, this environment where they are gonna to wanna to link up like this and we're telling them to get organized in a fashion that's gonna create a web. 
oversimplification of what's happening, but I want you to visualize that. And every time I do a series of stretches and folds, it's going to organize that web more and more and more and more intricately. When you have really strong wheats, like the hard wheats, that happens very quickly. And when you have softer wheats that don't come together as efficiently or as well, it's gonna take more work to get there. So my dough was really slack a moment ago. That means it just kind of slopped over like this. And as I'm working this, are you noticing that the dough is starting to get more and more taut? It's kind of sitting up on its own and it's not sort of falling back down. The dough is also kind of resisting me. I'm trying to stretch it out and it's sort of telling me, I don't really want to anymore. So what I'm gonna do is stop and give it about 20 to 30 minute rest. And in that 20 to 30 minutes, the gluten proteins will unkink a bit. They'll stay organized, but they'll unwind enough so that I can come back and give it more organization with more stretch and folds. So I'm gonna set this aside for 20 minutes and we're gonna talk about how your breads are gonna look different based on the kinds of flours that you're using. Okay, so I'm gonna go wash my hands. Let's say you were making this bread with all bread flour. You would have a big open hole crumb structure on the inside of your bread. That means when you cut it open, there's lots of big holes in there. And that's great, except you're not going to get a lot of flavor because white flour has no flavor. And again, bread flour, all-purpose flour, cake flour, and pastry flour, they're just made from the starch inside the wheat berry seed. So they don't contain any bran or any germ, any real nutrients. It's just the starchy, sugary stuff. So it, got, it does do really well to power your bread because bread flour is made from a hard red wheat, which has a lot of really strong gluten proteins. It just has all the good flavored stuff sifted out. So if you were to make your bread with 100% whole wheat flour, like one of those traditional bags at the grocery store, that is made from the same wheat as the bread flour is. It's just the bran has not been sifted out. And typically that's made from hard red wheat. And that's the kind of wheat um, that has the most amount of flavor and is the thirstiest. So if you did straight up 800 grams of that whole wheat flour from the bag at the store, your bread would be a little bit denser. It wouldn't have as big an open hole because a lot of the water in your dough is gonna get robbed by the bran. Does that make sense? Also, the, the bran likes to cut through those gluten strands and it makes it a little bit more difficult for the gluten strands to organize into a web. That said, that loaf of bread is gonna have an incredible amount of flavor. So don't be afraid of doing 100% whole wheat bread. If you did uh, all bread flour except for 200 grams, you used rye or spelt. Your dough would not be as t your bread wouldn't be as tall. Hi, hey, this is Zavi. Hi. We're talking about how breads look depending on what kind of flour you okay. use. Okay. So if you were to use rye flour, know that you're not going to get any extra lift from the rye, but you're going to get a ton of flavor. So there's two kinds of rye bread in the world. There's deli rye, which is white bread that has Ooh. some caraway seeds and rye wheat berries stuck in it. Um, and hold on, I'm gonna move this right back. And um, it's not really rye bread because traditional rye bread is that's 100% rye is really, really dense. And that's because rye doesn't have those two gluten proteins that can link up and bind. Um, what, uh, just take the new one. So sit outside and eat the babka. Eat the babka here. You can eat it here while we're talking and then you gotta take it outside and we're gonna start working the dough again, okay? Okay. All right, so rye flour doesn't have that ability to expand. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of gluey. So traditional rye bread is a brick. It's really dense and deli rye, which is white bread that has a little bit of rye and um, caraway seeds stuck in it is really tall because it doesn't really have that much rye flour in it. So if you were to do um, 600 grams of bread flour and 200 grams of rye, you would still get a nice tall loaf of bread and you would also get some of the flavor from the rye in there. So it wouldn't be quite as tall as if you did 100% bread flour, but you kind of get the best of both worlds. My favorite flour to use, like by and large, is spelt. That's this right here. 
S P E L T. Um, and again, it's not going to produce the tallest loaf. Sometimes I do 100% spelt, but it's um, really, really lovely because I'm a little distracted by the guy in the back. Um, but the flavor is like nutty and sweet and lovely and very delicate. Okay, so that is the talk about the different kinds of flours that we're using to make our bread. And in a moment, do you want to pull down your favorite flour? Yes. Okay, what is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can hold that. My favorite flour is Sonora. Okay, Sonora is a soft white wheat. Um, I don't use this a lot for bread making unless I'm baking my bread in a loaf pan. Um, let me show you what Sonora looks like in its natural state. This is Sonora, so this flour here. It is better than AP because it has more um, flavor. That's what brainwashing does, folks. It's really good sometimes. Hey. So yeah, it does have really good flavor and I use it one for one like all-purpose flour. So I it, love it with pancakes, crepes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cookies, it makes really yeah. good cookies. All right, so I'll be right back. We're gonna learn how to go to our next step in just a moment. So I look forward to seeing you then for part two of yeah. sourdough bread making. See you in a bit. Bye.